from Devil May Care Brewing. I have uh, something from their Christmas collection. Yeah, I know it's March. Um, this is the airing of Grievance's Mold Holiday Stout with Cranberry. 5.5%, uh, 5 .5%, 24 IBU, strong beer. This winter stout is perfect for the holidays, full of cranberry orange and just a hint of mulling spice. Enjoy it alone by the fire or over a festivist dinner with the people you tolerate once a year. So today I'm going to take a quick look at uh, this new power supply, this D3806. I'm not going to go too deep into all the menu stuff and all the possible things that it can do. Because Julian Eilitz got a video doing exactly that, and it's up there, and he's done a very good job of it. So what I'm going to do is give it a test, make sure it works properly, um, and then I'm going to build a case for it uh, so that I can use it. This one here, you may recall from a very long time ago, I built this case for it just to keep stray bits of wire from flying into it and it works just fine um so i want this one in a case too so that it's protected from stray bits of component lead and splashes of solder and whatnot because it's theoretically capable of putting out 38 volts at 6 amps which would be a hell of a spark so just a quick tour um, for connections we've got input screw terminals we've also got a barrel jack on the input side which is convenient because i tend to power stuff like this off a laptop power brick uh, it's got a dc 12 volt fan plug there so i'll go digging through my old laptop or my old uh, computer fans and see if i've got one of those kicking around over on this side, it's got screw terminals for the output, and that one's a little bit rotated when they soldered it down, but whatever, that's not a big deal. Um, the obvious current shunt there, got a couple of, what are these guys? That one is an XL Semiconductor XL4016. It probably shouldn't come as any surprise that the XL4016 is a DC to DC converter. It's a 40 volt buck converter. Here's just an example circuit, uh, eight to 40 volts in, five volts at eight amps out. Uh, it's a fixed output in this particular example, but you just change the ratio in this voltage divider to adjust the voltage. And this one is an NCE6580. A big honking MOSFET that's capable of up to 80 amps wow so that guy's going to be uh being controlled by probably a little boost converter chip somewhere else on the board that i haven't found yet but this has definitely got enough oomph to do the job that's enough of that kind of preliminaries i'm more interested in just making sure that it works and then getting it uh serviceable so that i can actually use it so let's uh plug into the barrel jack here Ooh, that's kind of a fleaky barrel jack. Okay, plan B. There, I'll put a little barrel jack adapter on here. And one thing I did notice in the listing is that it doesn't have input polarity protection. So I have to use my brains as that. So positive input is on that side and positive input is on that side. So I've cleverly marked that with red so I know where it is. So now we should be able to plug it in. The first thing I notice looking through the camera quickly is that you pretty much can't see that and it is quite bright. So I have a solution for that. Let's put some red tape over it for now um, until I dig out my tail light repair tape that I've got on all the other stuff around here. How's that? You like that better? Okay, now that we've got that on there, let's just uh, check its output voltage using this little guy. The controls on this are the same as the controls on this one. They have a set, uh, an up and down arrows, and an OK. Right now it's showing 5 volts, and it's set for a 1 amp current limit. So if I push the OK, it should turn on the output, 4.97. See these two LEDs here, the top one is constant voltage mode, which it's in, 
and the bottom one is output which is output is on and the middle one is constant current which it's not current limiting but we have a nice 5.01 volts there uh, that's showing a couple of millivolts different that's I noticed that's the same on the other one too when it does that so let's crank up the voltage all the way to the top 30.23 volts there, 30.3 volts there. Okay, so we've topped it at 38 volts, 37.99 there, 38.2 over here. Now, I think I want to check its current as well. So we'll grab some big resistors there. There's 100 ohms, 38 volts over 100 ohms. It's going to be about 380 milliamps, approximately. There we go. That's pretty much exactly what we calculated, wasn't it? Do I have... Yeah, I do have another 100 ohm resistor. Okay. Let's put that in parallel with it. Should be 760 milliamps, give or take. 764. That's reasonable enough. I like that. And it's still holding its voltage. 38 volts, essentially. Good. These 8 ohm resistors, hmm. Okay, it's not pretty, but I've got them in series. Uh, so that should be 16 ohms. It should be about 2.37 amps, the give or take. And since I don't have this thing uh, doing anything else, I'll clamp it on. So you may notice that these are not your typical clip weeds. These are made out of 16 gauge wire. So I'm not going to have any current loss, or not any significant voltage loss. So it's currently winning at 2 amps. Uh, 1.84 there is what it's saying. Those are getting fairly warm. But it's happy doing it. Let's turn up the current limit here. 2.2. 2.4. Okay, so why didn't it want to go above? Ow! Those resistors are toasty, toasty warm. And as predicted, the wires are nice and cool. Okay, so I've got at least two and a half amps worth. Why is that shutting down? <laughs> yeah, there's the laptop brick. Uh, it's capable of 4.7 amps at 19 volts. Is 89 watts. 38 volts at 3 amps is 114 watts that's why and then if you assume that this thing is somewhere in the 80 to 90 percent efficient range yeah that's why so if i want to run this thing at high current at high voltage i'm going to have to come up with a better source of incoming power but that's okay this thing ow ah son of a bitch so uh i'm convinced that this thing works and it can put out uh way more power than I'm probably going to need and more than I can source. So that's good. Next thing, I'm going to try and figure out some kind of a case for this thing. So one possibility that I was thinking of for a case is to just build another DIY plastic box like that. But to get the screen and the buttons up above the top of the box, above these heat sinks, because obviously the box would have to clear those. I'd have to lift this uh, little control panel up. So I dug around and I found these little stackable header pin things like that. So that clears the height of that quite nicely. And I could build myself a little plastic case that just comes in right like that. Gives a little bit of clearance above the heat sinks. Not too much though. And those heat sinks got fairly hot. Not as hot as these resistors over here, but fairly hot. So I'm not sure if I want a plastic box right there. And then that would be, you know, just a little bit bigger than the unit itself. I don't know, that takes up a lot of real estate on my desk though. So since this can be unplugged and moved around, I think I might want to just make extension cables for that and extend that out into a smaller box. Maybe one kind of like that and have that on the desktop and then have this off to the side somewhere. 
so that I can see this and control it on the desktop somewhere and then uh, just have this you know, in another case off to the side maybe with the cooling fan in it hmm I'm gonna have to look around here for some materials I'm gonna need some cable to extend that with and a source of power a better power brick than the one that I was using and uh, yeah so cable a case okay Okay, so this should be a much better power supply. It's 120 watts, so I should be able to get uh, closer to 3 amps out of that thing, which is still half of its rated current. I'm going to have to come up with something bigger, but this is the best I can find right now. For a case, I'm going to use this old toasted ATX power supply. So make use of its fan. Um, I'll run the this cable in through there and into there and and then there's this wire here it is 25 conductor it is a stranded wire for flexibility and where does it say here somewhere 24 gauge which for the data connections is probably fine uh, but okay so this is 25 conductor um, I need 16 conductors for this eight pins on each side which leaves me nine extra connect uh, conductors so I think if I use two times four of those for the power uh, coming out onto the bench four 24 gauges in parallel that's an effective wire gauge of 18 gauge okay and the maximum this calculator will do is 24 volts um, this is in feet this is annoying but whatever uh, let's call it three feet. That's just shy of a meter. I'm going to allow for a 1% drop. Calculate at 18 gauge for a 1% drop at 3 amps. I could go up to 23 feet. Okay. What if I do 6 amps? 18 gauge, I could go up to 6 feet and they would have point, I would have less than 1% drop that's good enough for me so this wire used to be for some extended uh, parallel uh, circuit parallel data circuits at work that obviously nobody uses that anymore uh, and it was scrapped out a long time ago so I fortuitously grabbed it out of the scrap there we go there's the pulse string have you seen this trick before? That's what that string's in there for, you know. Ain't that handy? There. So now I'll just separate these pairs. So that I can keep them straight. This is going to be a bit challenging for me. As I'm sure I've said before that I am somewhat colorblind. So before I make any actual connections... I'm going to just wring it all out with my meter. So now that I've got those cable ends kind of separated out and just grouped. Um, so there's going to be eight of them in control lines. There's the other eight. Um, that one's going to be all the po or all positive. That one's going to be all negative running off to the bench. Well, actually, let's let's look at the, uh, the box that I prepped a little bit. Um, so I'm going to use one of these little boxes here and I've uh, pulled this off and I've just I've used a little trick that I saw I can't remember who it was I think Jimmy Duresta I just stuck tape over top of this thing and around where I needed it to be and then cut it out in exactly the same size and stuck it on here and then I can just make my outline and then over here I've got spots measured out to put a couple of binding posts and that'll be my output to the world 
then I can just feed those to whatever I want. And I marked off for a little hole there. And that should all fit. And the reason that's offset is because the cable is going to be coming in like that. So it gives me room to fan it out and it doesn't get in the way. And should be able to get past the binding post without any problems. So there's that. It's a nice big fan on this one. I hope the fan wasn't the part that died on it. I don't think so. I think it just stopped making voltage. Hey, there we go. Wow, that's a lot of dust. So I think that'll sit kind of centered in there. Um, that's the input, that's the output there. Here's where my cable's going to come in. I think I'll keep this switch here and switch the incoming power through that. And then there's the fan plug there. So that should be good. There and there and there. I think I'm going to measure it a little bit more precisely just to, uh, just to make sure because they should be all the same. I am actually going to lengthen these pillars a little bit, just like that, so I can use a little bit longer screws, but uh, that's part of the benefit of having an accumulation of parts. You can just swap stuff out easily and quickly. Plus, I think that'll make it a lot saner and safer and further from the, uh, further from the shorting potential. Okay, there is that mounted in there. Is that fan connector the right power? The right, uh, no, it is not the right connector. Dagnabbit. So, I couldn't find a connector in my accumulation to meet with that. An oversight, I know. Um, look for those in a mailbag coming up in a few months. Meanwhile, I dug through my parts and I did find the mating connector for this one. Okay, that wasn't so bad. That fits on there now. And the red wire goes to the positive side, so I don't have to redo it. Good. So this is the negative wire from the power supply, from the uh, power brick to the converter. There is the positive wire, and this is a sense wire that was inside the core of that that I don't need, so I've just peeled that back out of the way. Being a little bit careful that I don't melt the body of that switch when I'm soldering that in. So while I've got the crimping stuff out, I think I will get these power cables done too. Strip all four of them back. Yeah, that's nice and solid and now for probably the most time-consuming part of this crimping these DuPont type connectors onto the ends I do have some four pin shells here which I'm going to use at least for the male pins that go onto this end I don't think they'll fit into the other end though um, I may have to come up with something creative and hopefully not too ugly to do on that end. But we'll see when we get there though. And there we go. Okay, now to connect this up. And I probably should have done that before I... Actually, yeah. Let me just hike that out of the case here for a second just to make it a little bit easier. Okay, there's the board back in and the power on there. I'll plug these guys in. And the order's not super critical at this point because I just have to make the other end match. But I do have them in what I believe to be color code order. Starting here, going that way. And then here, going that way. 
So I just have to remember that. Now then a little bit of cable management, if it's possible to get in there. This is mostly for strain relief, not so much for tidiness. But tidiness is important a little bit here too. Um, I don't want wires ending up in the fan. Let's attach that one to this one for now. I may do something else later, but this is a start. Cinch that down, snip it off. When you're snipping cable ties, always use flush cutting pliers. Don't use side cutters because side cutters will leave a nasty little uh, knife edge there. Flush cutters is what you want. You'll thank me. Another day, same project. So I've uh, started to drill at the corners of all my, my cutouts. I'm hoping that I can just make nice straight lines across, uh, across those that I'll have cutouts with nice rounded corners, very artistic, very special. And I've drilled at the center of that one and, and um, pilot drilled for these things. I need to expand it up a little bit and I need to expand that one a whole lot. And I also need to trim this little board holding pillar out, which was a lot easier than I thought it was going to be. Okay. So I think I'll just use a knife and where's my straight edge to sort of do these guys here. I'll probably have to file them a little bit at some point, but we'll get there in the end. And I think, as I've mentioned before, when you're cutting your way just with a knife through plastic, don't try and do it all in one pass. Just make a bunch of different, uh, bunch of passes and you'll get through it. If you push too hard, you're going to lose control and end up skittering across your workpiece and across your thumb. And you know, nobody wants that. Yeah, yeah, that'll be nice. And that will go. That's starting to look like something. I love these step drills. Just fits. Perfect. Okay, just one more little square to cut out here, and then I'll be done with the plastic butchery. Okay, that took me a long time. What's the next step? I guess get the wires inside here and figure out how I'm going to terminate them. Because I don't have a lot of clearance. Where's the back of that box? Oh, i got a little bit of clearance back there. Do I have room to put them on the back and close the lid? That would be ideal. That way I wouldn't have to... Uh, solder directly to the pins, but I don't think so. I don't think that's going to work. Oh, it's so close. Using my old cutters that have got nicks in the blades. Can I take them down just a little bit here? Oh, I can. Let's see what happens now. Oh, yeah. And there's even just a little bit of slack in there. Which means I'm going to have to put something behind that. But that's okay. Cool. So now I can just solder onto those pin header pins. And the whole thing is reversible. I like that. Alright. This is just going to be strip and solder and strip and solder and strip and solder. I just have to remember to do them in order. And it doesn't matter which end I start at as long as I'm consistent. Because this can go on either way. This is going to be almost as finicky as dealing with that little surface mount stuff. Maybe I should change to a smaller tip on my iron. That's better. Sorry if my head's in the way. I'm just going to keep doing this a bunch more times. There that is, and I have to bend them over like that to get it to fit on, right? So I'll shrink it down and then go cross-eyed doing the other one. 
not super pretty, but I think it's going to work. I don't see any shorts, but as soon as I get this shrunk down and kind of held in place, I'm going to grab my meter and just test it end to end and see what I've done. So this, sh this should be the positive power. Good. This should be negative power. Good. Okay, and there's nothing between them. That's good too. Okay, that was the easy one. So a new meter that beeps louder and faster. It's actually the blue wire. And none of the others. Good. And I'll just go down the line here. That should be the white with the blue stripe. And nothing else. Yep. As I expected, the the green and the brown pair I seem to have gotten swapped around here. Actually, no. The green wire I got okay. And the brown wire I got okay. It's just the whites that go with them I got swapped. So I think I'll swap them at this end just because it'll be easier. That's the benefit of using the crimp pins and the uh, downside of soldering them like I did at the other end. Okay, there's that. I'm just going to retest to make sure I didn't bugger it up. So that should be that one. And that should be that one. Good. In retrospect, I probably should have used a larger case. But I'll make it work. Okay, I have everything in there and I've gone through and just spread the wires out a little bit so that just to absolutely make sure they're not touching. I'm going to put a little piece of the wire jacket in there just to pack it out. And the lid fits. And everything works. Now that I've got the lid on there, I'm going to take it back off one more time and just double, double check that everything matches. And I got the right wires on the right end. Okay, place your bets. So far so good. The fan works. This turns on. And most importantly, there's no smoke. So that says 38 volts. See what the bananas say. And I turn it in 2 amp current limiting. Oops. Let's put that into the right range. 38 volts. Ha ha ha! We have a winner. Let's crank the voltage down here. Yep, that works. Wahoo! Well, I'm excited. Um... Now all that's left to do is put the lid back onto this, which is just four screws. That's a piece of cake. And find a place off to the side. I think over there somewhere. Because um, that's kind of how I designed it so that that can come in from that side. And, uh, yeah. I am pleased. Well, um, I hope you, uh, hope you enjoyed that. Or at least didn't get so bored that you wandered off early. Um. Any questions or comments down below in the comment section as usual. I'm sure there's ways that I could have done this better, but this is the way I did it. As it says at the bottom, um, this isn't the only way to do it. It's probably not the best way to do it, but it's the way I did it. Thanks for watching. I'll talk to you later.